Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, so thank you for stopping in. Uh, today we have Karen Collins from the New Hampshire Higher Education Assistance Fund. Um, she's going to walk us through kind of the ins and outs of the financial aid application process. She's been doing this presentation here for us for quite a while now. Um, it is a great one, so take notes. Um, she'll be here afterwards, too, if you have any questions. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, well, welcome on this nice first morning. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Karen. I'm one of the college counselors from the Center for College Planning. We're part of the Needs Network organizations. We have offices in Concord, um, so we meet with families in our Concord offices um, through this whole college process, so everything from figuring out the list of colleges to um, financial aid, which is kind of our big piece of the process. We have families that um, come into our office and file the FAFSA form with us. So from start to finish, you can come in and we tell you what to bring, the tax forms and your W-2s and all of the pieces and parts that we need to file those forms and sit down with one of us and we'll send that right off to the schools that your student is applying to that day. Um, we start that October 1 because that's when the FAFSA opens. We are still filing at this point in time for, uh, for some of the seniors as well as for returning students on the college campuses. Um, everything we do is free, so that is a good price in this whole college process. As you start getting further into it, you'll realize that there's not a whole lot that's free. Um, one of the big things that you should take advantage of, though, that is free is right here with your school counselors because they really have uh, the expertise working with students from your school, which is pretty amazing um, to have that here. So they're pretty well aware of where students are getting in with a certain profile from public school, um, where they may not be getting in with that certain profile, so they can kind of help your students to make that list of schools that are, you know, reach school, target schools, and safety schools as they go through that process. And we're going to talk about that in terms of how that works for financial aid as well. Um, so my job is to talk a little bit about the financial aid process and get you ready for that. Um, how many, what year are your students? Juniors. Are they all juniors? Juniors. Perfect. Okay, that's perfect. So let's talk about that um, in terms of this process coming up for you um, really next fall in October. <coughs> all right, so let's get you going here. So one of the things is we do have this, um, this particular uh, presentation as well as all of our other presentations are up available online on our website. So on the back of that booklet is um, our website. You can jump on and go to the handouts page and everything about financial aid is there. Um, lots of stuff on the website. So definitely jump in and check that out. And then one of the biggest things that's really important to understand, I think, is that there are two types of financial aid. When you're receiving those award letters from the colleges, um, you're going to see probably both of these types of aid on your student's award. The first tip is the good stuff. That's the gift aid. Gifts we like. Gifts are free. Um, so gift aid is free <coughs> money. Money that your student or you as parents don't have to pay back when they graduate from college. There's generally two types, um, and you'll see two different types of um, words up there on your, on your award potentially. Merit-based. Um, means that this is based on something your student has done really well. You know, whether that is great, which is the main reason we're seeing merit-based um, scholarship, is because of our students' grades. So they did really well academically, they did well in their test scores, and they're receiving a scholarship from the institution based on that. But there's also athletic money, so some of our students are continuing on. We were actually just talking about one of your students who is a point guard now um, at Creighton. Um, my dad goes to Seton Hall, so rival school, but we'll let it go this time. <laughs> will be okay. Um, so he, I'm sure, is there on a scholarship, um, some, some merit scholarship as well. Community service is another one that we're starting to see some more um, availability for students in terms of merit scholarship, leadership, um, but really that academic is the biggest piece. So wherever your students are at academically, we find the schools where they're going to be a big fish in that pond, where their academics exceed the expectation in terms of admission, and that's where they're going to get that type of merit scholarship from those schools. So the schools that are reach schools on our students' list aren't the schools that they're necessarily going to get those big academic merit scholarships, right? Because if that's a reach school for our students, um, that means that their grades are slightly below the average candidate coming in, or maybe their test scores are slightly below, which puts them slightly below that scholarship level um, in terms of getting those big awards. So we want to make sure that when we're making the list of colleges, um, if we're looking for academic merit scholarship and we're applying to schools where our students kind of exceed those expectations so we can get that kind of money. And again, that's where your college counselors are coming in to help you guys do that, and they 
they know this theory, they do this very well with our students, so you guys are in great shape. The other piece of that, um, for some of our students, we may see what are called grants, and grants are usually need-based. So those are based on our family finances, not something we can really change. We report those numbers uh, to the federal government, they calculate them, and based on that, some of the colleges and sometimes the federal government are able to award our student grants as well. So students can get a combination of the two depending on the college. Some schools don't offer merit scholarships, so that's another consideration as you go through the process. <coughs> if we're kind of hoping that our students are going to get those merit scholarships because they've done really well here, we want to make sure that you're applying to schools that offer merit scholarships because there are some that don't. So we pay attention to those kinds of things when we're putting together um, our list of colleges for the students. Um, Self-help is the other kind of award um, that our students are, are going to see for sure. So every student receives some type of self-help in the form of federal loans. So every one of our college students heading off as freshmen is going to be offered a $5,500 um, student loan, called a director or um, Stafford loan, uh, as part of their award. So students can borrow in their own name $5,500 as freshmen. As sophomores, they can borrow $6,500, and then when they're juniors and seniors, and for some of our students who have additional undergraduate years, um, it would be $7,500 that they can borrow. So moms and dads, we don't co-sign that. Um, the bill comes in and it goes right to you guys. So your name, students are on that, not, not mom and dad. So that loan is always in the student name. And it doesn't matter what our income is, what our assets are, the students are always offered that particular loan. And you don't have to take it, but you can take it if you choose to. And then some of our students are going to get work study as well. So students might be able to get a little job on campus, and it might say on the student's award, you know, work study, $2,000. That money doesn't actually come off the bill. So that's a little bit tricky when you're trying to, you know, compare your schools from one to another. It won't come off the bill, but our students can go to school. They have to get the job. You know, they have to apply for a job, get the job on campus and then work a certain number of hours per week in order to earn up to that $2,000. So that usually comes to them like in the form of a paycheck. So they might get a paycheck every other, student might get a paycheck every other week on campus, and your moms and dads might say, hey, that's your spending money, and when you call home and say, hey, mom, do you want to transfer some money into my account? They're going to say, hey, kid, you remember that thing called a work study job? How's that going, right? So feel free, parents, to use those words when your students call home, because mine does regularly. Mom, can you transfer some money? I have to do this thing. And she makes it sound like very official, that she really needs it, and maybe it's not always really true. So yeah, feel free to use that. But work study is a really nice way for them to get involved on the campus and to meet some of the adults on the campus, sometimes a professor, or sometimes they work for admissions as tour guides. Um, some of them drive the campus shuttle around. You know, so there's different things that they might get involved in, but it's a good way to, to get a little study money. So applying for financial aid, um, there's two forms to be aware of. So the first form up here is called the FAFSA form, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And that's the one that everybody files. So whether you're going to a public college or a private institution, or whether you're looking at two-year schools or four-year schools, or you're looking at schools that are in your state or out of your state, it doesn't matter because they're all going to ask for the FAFSA form. And that form, um, is free to file, so you do it online, and it's about 100 questions when, when families are filling that form out, so it's not terrible. It's not gonna be the most fun day of your life, probably, and you're not gonna you know, wanna do some cartwheels or anything like that, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, it does follow our tax forms, so it will say, you know, we're looking for your adjusted gross income on this line, and on a 1040, that's gonna be line 37. So it kind of you know follows right along with our tax forms the tax forms are changing, so this form will change a little bit as well. Um, so it's pretty, it's a pretty straightforward form. The second form up here, um, I suspect some of you are going to also need to file, it's called the CSS Profile Form. It's a product of the College Board, um, so you would go actually onto the College Board website and that's where you would register for the CSS Profile Form. This is used by some of the private colleges um, typically, the more competitive private colleges are using this form. So in our state, it's just um, St. Anselm College and Dartmouth College that are using profile or requiring profile. But as you go south into Massachusetts, particularly, you're going to see a whole lot more schools that are going to be requiring the CSS profile. So it's really important to check either on the website, the college board website, um, or each and, I should say, and each of the college websites to see if this is a form that's also required 
in addition to the FAFSA form. The tricky thing about these forms is that there's no one deadline. So just like students, you're, you're seeing that each college might have their own application deadline as you're completing that common application online. Also, the schools may have their own financial aid deadline. So some of your schools may want this form November 15th, and another one may not need it until March 15th. So watching those deadlines is what's going to become, you know, a little bit of a project as we get towards that senior year. When my daughter was going through this, we actually kept a calendar on our refrigerator because we all had to look there, or we all were going there very often, and it just had college stuff on it. And of course, I'm type A, so things were color-coded. Admission deadlines were one color, and financial aid deadlines were another, so that we could keep track of everything. I do this for a living. It's still tricky. To, to make sure you hit all those deadlines. And then if there are special scholarships that your students might be um, applying for on campus, there might be yet another deadline in terms of financial aid. So just keeping track of that, making students, you typically do things online, you know, so you might have a spreadsheet or you might have it on your phone, whatever works the best for you. Um, and I bet your college counseling office has some type of a, you know, way of showing you guys how to keep track of all this stuff. So as you get into that, they'll work with you on that. Um, but that's important to keep track of all these deadlines as you go along. So I'm going to talk first about the FAFSA and then we'll talk a little bit about CSS as well. But the FAFSA form is really, the purpose is to kind of gather our financial information. So it's a family form. So they're going to gather the information of the parents and of the student who is going to college. And taking all of that information and putting it through this magic formula behind the scenes and coming out with um, as we press submit, what's called an ESC or an expected family contribution, and that number is really important. That's the amount of money that the federal government says that we can afford to pay for one year of college. You probably won't agree with that number and say, yeah, of course I can write a check for that amount for one year of college. Um, but that number is what goes to the schools and they use that to put together an award for students for financial aid. That number, they're also assuming a couple of things within that number. So it is going to be higher than what you think it might be. Um, but it's they're assuming that both the parent and the student are contributing to this education in some way or form. They're assuming that we might take some out of our savings to help pay for that education. We might take some out of our current income to help pay for education. And they're assuming we are going to borrow to some extent um, based on those figures. So when you're looking at those, remember it's not necessarily that they're asking us to write a check for that amount. But that is an amount that they're assuming we can afford. So that's where the colleges are going to start. So basically, we will probably pay that expected family contribution unless our student receives merit money above that amount. So that number is important. Um, you actually can estimate that. So if you want a really fun evening, um, once you know you have met with your students, you can go online. And one of the places that I like to go is um, it's finaid, F-I-N-A-I-D dot org, and you can play with a um, ESC calculator and see what that number is going to look like. Um, this is what the FAFSA looks like when we go online. If you filed a FAFSA in the past, it has changed look this year, so that surprised us. We didn't know it was coming, so when we were filing over the summer, suddenly this came up, and it was a different look. It is correct. <laughs> it is the right one. Um, it's pretty, you know, pretty user friendly as you go through the process, um, which is great. And um, when you're doing this, one of the things to remember is this is our students' form. So a lot of times the parents are filling it out for the student, but it's the students' form. So use the students' um, information as you go through. One of the things on the FAFSA form that's really helpful is what's called an IRS DRT or data retrieval tool. This is a way that we can, um, one, within the FAFSA form, so if we're in the parent section and we're filling out the parent financial information, there's a link to the IRS that we can use to pull our tax information into the form, which is kind of great because it goes on to our taxes, it pulls the right information from the right line of the tax form and puts it into the right line on the FAFSA form for us. The other piece about that is colleges have to verify the information that they receive. They can't assume, you know, it's one of their auditing pieces that they have to go through. They can't assume that everything that we put on that form is always, you know, 100% correct. They have to verify that information with their taxes. By doing this, by using that IRS DRT, we're verifying our information right away for the colleges. So um, most students that are using DRT are not being selected for verification because they've already kind of gone through that process. Couple of things with that. Um, when you do it, 
it's going to bring you out to the IRS website and you'll see that. You'll see your name in the top and you'll see how you filed your taxes. So if you marry filing jointly, it'll say that right on there. We have to put in our mailing address on that form and then we're able to link them up. One of the things with that is you really have to put it exactly like you did it on your tax form. So if you live at 101 Main Street and on your tax forms when you file, you wrote S-T-R-E-E-T, -E -E but you're putting onto the IRS form S-T, it's not going to link. So there are a couple of times we have to play with it just a little bit to get it to you know, talk to each other, but it has to be exact. So if you have your tax forms right with you, it, it works out really well. If you file separately but you're married, then it also doesn't work because you can't pull it in twice. You would have to just kind of add your tax information together. But this is a nice way to be able to verify the information and also we know that the information is getting onto the right lines as we um, use the DRT. And you can use it for your students as well. So students, if you worked um, in that year, you can use those as well. So we have to electronically sign the FAFSA form because of course it's not a paper form any longer. And to do that, we have to have um, a username and a password and it's called an FSA ID. The student needs their own FSA ID and one of the parents needs an FSA ID. So if you've already filed a FAFSA for one of your other students um, and you have as a parent an FSA ID, just keep that one, that's fine. But we need to make a new one for that new student heading off to college. It's not a tough process, but it's one that takes a few minutes to do. So you can do that now if you wanted to. You can do it when you file your FAFSA. It's live, so it used to be back in the day, you know, you had to get a PIN number, and you had to wait 72 hours to get that PIN number once you went through. This is live. Once you do it, you can use it. You can sign your FAFSA right away. So it's pretty easy to do. Um, a couple of things with that is, um, you keep the information somewhere safe, and, and I say this because, you know, I didn't remember mine, um, make sure that you verify um, your FSA ID using your email address and using your mobile phone number because we can retrieve username and password very quickly using either of those sources, but if you haven't verified that you haven't gone through that step, um, we can't and we have to use challenge questions to try to retrieve that information and then it locks you out for 30 minutes. So um, that's kind of a pain. Um, so write everything down, keep it in a safe place. You will use this from year to year, so all four years that your student is an undergraduate, you will use this, um, the FAFSA form, the FSA ID, to into the FAFSA form. So set those up, you know, whenever it makes sense for you guys, but those are coming down the pipe. So some of the things that we see that either families have trouble with or that kind of hold up the process, one of the things is whose FAFSA is this? So we often have a phone call in our office that says, hey, you know, I'm trying to get into the, to, to my FAFSA and I can't get in there and it's not showing anything and why is that? Well, are you the parent or are you the student? Well, I'm the parent. And then we say, you know, are you using your FSA ID or the student's and they're using their own? If we try to get back into a FAFSA using our own FSA ID, it's thinking that we're looking for our own FAFSA and there's not one there. So it's always under the student. So and as we're completing the form, it's the student too. We have to make sure that, you know, the first couple of pages there is student's social security number. That's a mistake we see often is because we're parents and we're filling these forms out, we put ours in by mistake and now it's linking that to you and it's not going to go through that social security check. Um, also, students generally aren't married, but a lot of times we see because again the parents are clicking things, they click married and, and that pushes them to a different um, different category on the FAFSA form and it kind of messes things up. So it's you, the student, first, there is a parent section, and then it goes back to the student to fill out their financial section. So always a student, always use the student's FSA ID to get back in as well. Deadlines, as I was saying earlier, they're all different from the different schools, which makes things really fun. So just keep track of those. Um, if your student is applying early decision at any colleges, those deadlines could be much earlier than some other students who might be applying regular decisions. So do keep track of you know, when those deadlines might be. Which year's tax returns do we use? So your students are juniors. So this year's students are using 2017 taxes to, to fill out the FAFSA form. So for you guys, you're going to use 2018 tax information to fill out the FAFSA form when, when your students are filing. A lot of times families say, well, you know, 2018 wasn't a typical year. I was working a different job or something changed in the family, so can I use my 2019 information? Can I use them to, can I use something different? 
we can't. This is a federal form. They're not overly flexible. Um, so we have to use that particular tax year. But if there are different circumstances, meaning that this next coming year is going to look really different, we want to make sure that you contact each of the schools and let them know that. There's something called a special circumstances form, and usually those are found on the financial aid webpage of each college. And on that form, you have the opportunity to say, hey, listen, you know, we have high unreimbursed medical expenses that we're paying off, or one of the parents lost their job or changed jobs, or whatever it may be. That information we can provide on the special circumstances form, and then the colleges can use professional judgment to override those numbers. Um, they have to do it. We're not able to do it. Um, and each college is going to do their own thing. You know, so some schools may use professional judgment and say, well, we're overriding that, and some may override it in a different way. So always let them know, though, anything that changes in your circumstances, even once your child is in college, you know, if anything changes in your family circumstances, let them know. That information is really important to do. So they can, you know, best judge what, you know, what they're able to offer. A lot of times I'll have um, somebody in the audience say, you know, um, so what if we, you know, kick our student out and they go live with grandma, can we, can, can they be an independent student and we don't have to put our finances on the form? No, it doesn't work like that. We don't get to do that. Yeah, so students to be independent, <laughs> yes, to be independent, students have to fit into certain questions and those questions are actually asked right on the FAFSA. So if our students are 24, they're automatically independent. So we're not there yet for that. Um, if our students are married, they're automatically independent. We're not there yet. Um, if they have a child of their own, they're independent. We're not there yet. We're not encouraging. Um, if they are in the military, or if they're veterans of the military, then they're automatically independent as well. If they are um, in a graduate program, so some of our students may continue directly into their graduate program right after undergrad. Our, our daughter's doing that, and she's 21, so she's not 24 yet. But she's a graduate student, so she automatically will be independent as she enters that program. So your students might do the same. Um, what else? If a student is in a legal guardianship, so they're living you know, with somebody who has been set up by the courts to be their legal guardian, those guardians do not go on the form. It's just the student. Um, if, they're in, if they were in foster care at any point after the age of 13, they're independent students. If they are an emancipated minor, um, we don't have that in New Hampshire, but other states do, they would be independent. And if they are homeless, they would be considered independent as well. So if I'd love living two years on your own and me not reporting him. And no, it has nothing to do with what, who reports him on the taxes. has nothing to do with that. has nothing to do, like in a divorce situation too, it, like, it has nothing to do with divorce decrees who files that FAFSA form. It's literally, the, if one of those things is not met, then they are not independent. So there are some exceptions, you know, there are some students who cannot live at home for abuse reasons, you know, there's different situations like that. Um, students who are like couch surfing, who cannot live at home for one reason or another, and they're kind of moving from couch to couch with their friends. Um, sometimes those students can be declared independent. It just, that is a special circumstance with this school. Unless they go click yes on one of those other ones, they would automatically. So if my kid after school decides to move out of the house, go get a job, mm -hmm. pay his own taxes, I don't claim him as a... No, it doesn't matter if we claim them. Until he's yeah. 24. Yeah. Until he's 24. Yeah. Some schools may look at it and say, It doesn't matter if we claim them as dependents at all. Like in a divorce situation. But you can claim them until they're 23. Now. Yeah. Well, we don't get her. She, she's phased out on ours, unfortunately. But yeah. So on the tax form, it doesn't matter. Like in a divorce situation. So like say mom and dad, student lives with mom, um, and, but dad claims the kids. Student lives with mom. So, so mom is, this, is the parent on the form. It doesn't matter who claims. They don't care who claims who on the tax. So FAFSA in that situation only uses the mom's income they will. as determination. Yeah, they will. So in a, in a divorce situation, what happens on the FAFSA form, um, 
it's really the parent on that form is the parent with whom the child resides 51 or more percent of the time. Um, a lot of times parents say, well, we kind of have a 50-50 custody agreement, um, and they don't care what a, a divorce decree says either, so they don't care what the custody agreement is, they just want physically where is that child, you know, more, more of the time over the last year. Um, so if it's 50-50, they say, well, there's 365 days in a year, so where are they on the 356, you know? They say, well, we split that day. <laughs> then the college says, okay, so whoever provides the most financial support for that child is the parent on the form. And a lot of times, it's also the parent that lives within the school district. You know, you guys are a little bit different because some of your students are boarding here, so that makes things a little bit different. But you know, for a student who is living in Londonderry, New Hampshire, and goes to school in Londonderry, New Hampshire, their dad who lives in California is not the custodial parent. So I live in Florida, but my mm -hmm. son goes to school up here. Can yeah. I claim him? Can, can he claim in state tuition? No, I don't think he can, because you live in Florida, so it would be with the parent resident because that's his full-time, his permanent residence. Yeah. It depends on the state. More. Depends on the state. Yeah, I don't make the rules. But I don't make the rules. <laughs> Promise. It, it depends on the state and what their institution rules are. I don't think in our state that counts. Yeah. It might be in a different state. What do you find? Yeah, for, for New Hampshire, it's not going to work. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Because they're more important student and the parent who's financially supporting them, you know, home is in their permanent residence is in Florida, yeah. So, I know New Hampshire, no, but I don't know about other states necessarily. Um, in New Hampshire, there's like actually forms that you have to sign for residency and actually the, the counselors are involved in that as well. Yeah. So, independent, um, parents we talked about, who are the parents, so in the case of a divorce, that's what they're looking at. Um, if you have more than one child in college at the same time, this is really important to make sure that you complete that information on the FAFSA form. They're going to ask you for the size of your family, and then they're going to ask you for how many are in college at the same time, how many students. We don't get to claim parents anymore, we used to, but um, just students. So make sure that if you have two students in college that you get that number two on both of their FAFSA forms, because what happens with that expected family contribution you're not suddenly going to be, you know, if your family contribution was expected to be $20,000 for student one who's in college, well, it shouldn't suddenly be $40,000, right? Because now you have another child in college. You're still the same family. You're still the same finances. So now that $20,000 is actually going to be divided between the two students that are in college, and they're going to actually become more eligible for aid at each of their own institutions. And sometimes that um, really makes a difference in terms of, you know, depending on where that EFC started, it could really make a difference in terms of need on some of the campuses. So make sure you get, you know, every student that's in college. You, sure you, you do, yeah, you do it every single year. It's really good. Um, it's really and it's a renewal for each student every year. But there's a trick. There is a trick if you have more than one in there. So file the one who's already in school first. And once you complete that one, there's a um, confirmation page that you get. There's a hyperlink that says, hey, you have a brother or sister that needs to file. Click it up. And that will bring your financial stuff in, and you'll just have to fill it out. You'll just have to fill your part. So it won't be as bad. So my, my daughter, will, next year, will be going into her junior year of college. Yes, it'll be a senior. We didn't do a FAFSA. Because, because she didn't qualify the first year. So right, so you didn't need to after that. Right, right, right. Thank so now am I going to have to do it because I would do it, it would help him to show two. I would do it. Why not? And it might help her. So she, but she has to do it, not me. She has to submit another FAFSA, and I'll pull my taxes. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, and because she's filed before, it would be hard to do. It's all in there, so you just pull it up with her FSA ID, and you'll just update the ta the tax information. That's all. Yeah, so it won't be bad. Hers won't be bad. And I was just telling this family, too, because you have two in, file hers first. So right. do her renewal first. And then once you submit it, on that page, there's like a hyperlink that says something like, do you have a brother or sister who needs to file? If you click it, it'll pull your parent information on the second FAFSA, and you only have to add the student information. So it just makes it a little easier. It doesn't always work for me, but most of the time, like when, when the IRS sites are up well, it works really great, and then you don't have to do it twice. But do two facts, one for each. But I would do it, just see, it might help her. No, no, having another one in because it divides things. So, might help. It's worth a try. Worth a try. For sure. And you want to do it definitely for your child going in because that school could have different levels well, of right. need. Yeah. So, even though it's a So, same. that when he goes in, uh, I have to tell her, go ahead and yeah, I would reapply. Do it. Yeah, I would do it. It's worthwhile. 
See, you can do a C. It's not, it doesn't cost us money. So I always say, file that FAFSA at least for your students freshman year in college. And there are a lot of scholarships that require FAFSA as well. Um, the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, if your student is a, is a New Hampshire student, the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation gives away you know, millions of dollars every year in scholarships. So you'd want to apply for those, and they do require an expected family contribution as part of that application process, so you'll need to file a FAFSA. Some of the individual high schools require it. I know in, in our state, London area requires um, a FAF, um, EFC on their uh, local applications. And do remember, too, that your students can apply for scholarships here, but they can also apply in their home state. So your students should be looking at the high school they would have been, you know, going to in Florida and see what those applicate, you know, what those scholarships are. They may be eligible for those as well. Why not, right? So it depends on the school, but I would take a peek at that as well. And we talk about special circumstances. Make sure you file those forms if there are anything, you know, there that you need. This is in the books, so I won't go through this a ton. But this just gives you an idea of what the FAFSA is looking for in terms of numbers. Most of it is coming from our income. So FAFSA is really income driven. We can't change that. We don't want to change that. That's what it is. So really, that's the biggest thing driving it. But assets are a portion of that. Um, for parents, we have asset protection allowance built into the form. So our assets are not as big a deal in this process as um, you know our income is. For parents, you can see like based on the age of the eldest parent, there's this protection built in. When you file your FAFSA, there will be a question that comes up and it will say, do your assets exceed this amount of money? And that's really just going to be based on the age of the eldest parents and whether you're married or, or not. Um, that number comes up and if you do not exceed that number, you click no and you move on. If you do exceed that number, you're going to click yes and three questions will pop up for the parent. The first one is, what do you have in your cash? What do you have in cash? Savings and checking as of today. So the day you file, what are in those accounts? You put that number on line one. Line two is going to be what are your assets? You know, they want to know um, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, 529 plans. Not our house, so not our primary residence. If we have a second home, that one does count, the equity in that counts. Um, not our 401ks, 403bs, you know, so nothing that's designated retirement, we don't include that information. It's really just um, you know, these things that are listed here that are going to end up going on to that particular line is investments. The third question is, um, do you have a business with more than 100 employees or do you have a working farm? I haven't had to answer that question since they added with more than 100 employees um, several years ago. Most families don't. You put zero and then you're done with asset questions. So if we have more than, you know, you're 45 years old and you have more than 11,000 $100 in, in those various investments, you're going to answer those questions. And at top, 5.64% of what you have above this protection would be considered part of that expected family contribution. So assets aren't big. You can see income is big, okay? That's the big part. For our students, things are really different for them. Um, they have no asset protection allowance because they're not the heads of the household, even if they think they are, but they don't have that asset protection, protection built in. So anything that they have in their name, 20% of that is going to be part of that expected family contribution. So if they have, you know, a savings account, or if they have stocks in their name, or um, they have, um, you know, di di different things, atmas and umas, those are students. So anything that is in their name, 20% of that. Anything in ours, so, just to know what's out there, for sure. The CSS is a little bit different. This form is about 300 questions. So, yeah. So it's a little longer. This is totally asset driven. They will ask about income, but it is asset driven. So here's where we get to include 401ks. Here's where we get to include our home. Here's where they ask, what are, what are your out-of-pocket medical expenses for the prior year? It's a little bit of calculation. What is your home worth? You know, what did you pay for your home? What year did you buy it? How much is it worth today? What are your payments? So they ask a lot of questions. They might ask what kind of car you drive. So most of the questions are standard, um, but each college has the opportunity to ask their own individual questions as well. You won't see, like, this is coming from 
XYZ college, you know, this is their question. But when you register, you're going to put the names of the colleges you need this form for in there, and based on that, certain questions might go onto your form. So one college may say, hey, what kind of car do you drive? And another college may say, hey, what does Fluffy the Cat have in her bank account? Um, just to gather as much information as possible. So this is asset driven. When we were going through this process, I assumed that schools that were asking that much more information about our finances we're not going to get this anymore, anything, because the schools that didn't ask these questions did. So what are we going to get from these schools? These schools that are using CSS Profile typically have a lot of need-based aid that they're awarding to students, so they need this information so they can make sure that they're awarding that to the neediest students on the campus. But usually they go much deeper into that need pool, so you'll find that things kind of balance out a little bit. So the schools that are offering merit-based aid, and your student is a strong student, they're going to get a, an award around here, right, for merit. Schools that are offering need-based aid are going to kind of settle around there in terms of need, is what we found as we went through the process. Not me exact. None of them are exact. But they're going to settle somewhere around the, the general area. So don't be afraid that the school is requiring a CSS profile. I was. Um, as we went through, even though this is my job and I've done it for a million years, they did kind of come through. You know, they're going to do it one way or another. They've got to kind of discount a little bit for our students to be able to get them there. And to be competitive, they have to do that as well. So they're going to go a little bit deeper into that need. So watch for schools, you know, needing that CSS profile. Check each website. Make sure that you understand um, whether they need that form or not. This one does charge, so it's not a free form. It's $25 to register and for the first school, and then it's $16 per school after that. Sound like the SATs? <laughs> it's College Board. So it is very similar to the SATs. So when you get to that point where you have to send SATs to the school, it's a certain amount per each school when you send them. Um, if your student is eligible for a fee waiver, they will get that on this form as well. The easiest way to fill out this form is to use your student's um, registration, their username and password that they have set up to for, for their SATs, or maybe they're on for Big Future and all those. That will pre-populate your form with a lot of the information your student is already, already has in there. So it just makes it a little bit easier to, to go ahead and do that. Keeps things all in one place. So, are we moving? You guys moving now? Uh, no, we still have okay. Okay. three all right. So what happens then, the financial aid office will put together this award for your student and they'll send it, either in the mail, some will still send it in the mail, but students should really be aware that when they get acceptances from the colleges, typically they're going to give the student um, a username and a temporary password to set up on the portal at the school. They should go ahead and do that, even if they don't know if they're going to that school or not. That's where the school is communicating with our students a lot of the time. We get calls in our office all the time saying, hey, you know what? I didn't get my financial aid award from XYZ, you know, from some of my schools. Well, which are those schools? And we say, well, yes, that's a school that's going to do it only on the portal. So they might not send a physical copy to the house. They're going to do it through the portal. So your student needs to be up on that portal, getting the messages, making sure they're checking that. So that's one piece about, you know, I will give you definitely about financial aid is it could come in different ways. Sometimes it's an email that students are getting as well. So the schools are going to put together that award and send that, that offer of financial aid off to all the families, which is when we get to um, compare what they're offering. So these are just talking about some of the different pieces. I want to make sure we get a little bit further too. We'll get deeper into the pieces as we go. Um, calculating financial needs. So remember, we we're talking about that expected family contribution, and it's going to be a particular number for each family. They're going to subtract that right off the top. So they're going to put together what's called a cost of attendance. When you look online, you're going to see tuition room and board prices. You're not necessarily seeing cost of attendance. This is billable and non-billable fees at the college. So books and transportation and pizza with their buddy on a Friday night is kind of included in that cost of attendance to try to give us a little aid for that as well. They subtract that EFC off the top. So they say, hey, we can afford that. And they're going to come up with demonstrated need. And that's the number that they're going to use to put together an award for a student. So if a college is $50,000, our expected family contribution is 20, then our students would be eligible for $30,000 at that particular institution. So that number changes from school to school depending on um, what their cost of attendance happens to be. Now, will they give us $30,000? That's in the school. So some schools have more money to give. And at some schools, our student is a bigger fish in the pond. You know, so if your student exceeds those expectations for admission, they've done a ton of stuff and they're a top candidate, then they're going to get the top award. 
but understand that the type of work can be different from school to school. <laughs> so that's where these pieces come in. So if the cost, like I said, I changed the number, of course, just to make it easier in my brain, but if the school's $55,000, which is more realistic, um, EFC is 15, student is eligible for 40,000. So the school says, great, this is a good student. They got a $10,000 presidential scholarship, which is typically their highest award. University grant, so this was based on need. And then the student loan, so they're subsidized, meaning that the federal government is taking care of interest while the student is in school. And unsubsidized, which means interest is accruing on that loan while our student is in school. But that totals the 5,500. Work study, the student got 25. So they came up with $25,500. But hey, wait a minute, we need 40. So what happens next? So they left us with a gap of um, $14,500. There's a piece, there it is. Um, but are we have to pay our ESC too, right? So there's that $15,000. We also have to pay work study because they don't take that off the bill. So we pay that up front. So we're gonna owe that school $32,000 in the end. Total family share is gonna be $37,500 because of that student loan. Student has to pay back $5,500. So is this typical? Yeah, sadly it is. Where can we change that? Okay, we can't change Grant, because that's based on need, we can change this piece. This is the only piece that we can really affect. So this school's top dollar was $10,000 in a $55,000 school. There are schools that have you know, thirty dollars and $40,000 scholarships. Let's look at some of those too, right? Um, we have to fit the category. So some of the schools, when my daughter was applying, you know, we realized later, oh, the top dollar was $15,000. But the school cost $60,000. That's not getting us close enough. Other schools, she was awarded more like $35,000. That got us a lot closer, you know, to that, that number. So applying to different types of schools, um, the great thing is, is that your college counselors understand this process and they're going to help your students to like, put together a list that makes sense. You know, if they know that merit aid is a consideration and your student is only looking at Ivy League colleges, they're going to say, we need to get some more schools on this list because Ivy League colleges don't offer merit aid, right? So we want to make sure that we mix it up. We have in-state, out-state, you know, we have all the different things on our list. So we want to make sure we do all of that when they're going through the process. Managing cost, families do a lot of different things. Um, it works different from year to year for every single family. So there's no one big formula but some of these things are what families are looking at. I will say that the Parent PLUS loan is something that gets packaged as part of an award for some of the different colleges, and some schools don't. We can always borrow on a Parent PLUS loan if we choose to, but it's not something that the college should necessarily put in as part of your award to make it look like they've met full need, um, and they might. So just be aware of that. This one has a real high interest rate. There might be other places that parents might want to borrow, and if you have questions about this as you go, please call me. Um, I would love to talk to you about that. Come see us. Um, give us a ring. If you're in Florida, give us a ring. Um, you don't have to come all the way back up. <laughs> Just give us a call and we'll walk through that with you. Scholarships, students, please, tons of scholarship applications. I don't think you're going to get away with not doing that here. Um, I think you're walked through that pretty well. There's national, there's local. Make sure that you're looking at your own local scholarships as well. And the last one I want to tell you real quick. Um, when you guys are seniors, I want you to think about the Destination College Speech Contest. We do Destination College. It's a statewide event for juniors. Um, you guys, the registration is live now. We are going to be at Plum State University on March 30th. It's a day of workshops. So you come, you register for different workshops um, about the NCAA, about writing your college essay, about financial aid, whatever. And then there's a college fair at the end. It's free. But you have to register because spaces are limited. But we have the opening um, session in the morning, our, we have a keynote address from a student who has written a three to five minute speech about the college process for the incoming juniors. That student is getting a thousand dollar scholarship for three to five minutes, and they're gonna be on a student panel that day. So students, when you guys are seniors, write a speech, three to five minutes, we select the winner and they get a thousand dollars, and then you come to Destination College and present. I work with that student, so they're not you know, suddenly starstruck in front of 1,500 people standing out in front of you that day. But um, but it's a great program, so do be aware of that um, for sure. And any other scholarships, and again, this is something that you have readily available, you know, certainly at your fingertips here at the school. Questions real quick before you guys head out? Too much stuff in a little amount of time, I know. 
we don't go away. You can call us anytime. Um, let me know what we can help you with. I, you know, we're in touch with my counselors here, so they can have how to reach us at any point in time. Have fun with your students. Enjoy your time. Have fun today. Stay warm. Thank you. Bye, guys.